Hello, everyone. Whoa. Can, can you all hear me? Good. Okay. It's a lot louder up here. So um, we have a, a few folks offering interpretation tonight. They're going to introduce themselves. Um, and I also just wanted to let everyone know the meeting is being recorded tonight. So if you would prefer not to be on camera, um, get behind the, the gentleman with the, the camera. Um, he's not going to be swiveling around. My name is Heidi, I'm the Spanish interpreter. Mi nombre es Heidi, estoy aquí para interpretar en español. Good evening, my name is Gina Miranda. I'm the Haitian Creole interpreter. Bonsoir, my name is Gina, so I'm going to interpret in Creole. Good evening, my name is Heisa Fernandez. I'm the Portuguese interpreter. Boa noite, my name is Heisa Fernandez. I'm the interpreter in Portuguese. Um, my name is Megan Ackerman. I work in the city's uh, communications office. Um, one of the things that I do is organize these resi staff meetings. Um, for those of you who don't know, we do them twice a year in all of the city's seven wards. Um, we try to cover uh, a lot of the, the big things going on, um, so for, especially for folks who maybe aren't as plugged in or as active or if you're, you're new to Somerville, um, gives you a good idea of some of the things that are going on, some of the things that are coming up, and hopefully some things that you want to get more involved with. Um, and just out of curiosity, who is at their first ever Resi Stab meeting tonight? Awesome. Yay. But yeah, clap. That's, that's why we clap. Um, clapping is definitely encouraged. Um, well, thank you for joining us for your first one, and thank you so much also to everyone who has come back. Um, so uh, just a, a couple of uh, quick announcements, things I wanted to plug. Um, first of all, uh, your ward alderman, J.T. Scott, um, is not here. I'm not sure if he may be joining us later or not. There was also um, a hearing scheduled on uh, the um, zoning overhaul that got scheduled tonight, so um, he's at that. but. Um, we are going to plan something probably in December, sort of a little more informal um, office hours, so um, stay tuned for that. We, we don't have a date yet, but that'll be another opportunity to, to come um, and chat with some of your elected officials and city staff. Um, and uh, we also uh, have early voting here in Somerville. Did anyone vote early? Come up to City Hall? Okay, great. So you can do that through Friday. Um, so if, uh, if you want to avoid a, a long line at your polling place uh, or the, the timing works out better for you, come up to City Hall and do that. Otherwise, um, you also have the opportunity to vote on the 6th in the regular election. Um, so I think that's it for me right now. Um, tonight we are going to be talking about something that um, I'm also a Union Square resident, so I, I know this as well as most of you. Um, we're all dealing with a lot of construction. Um, and there is more coming up. So tonight that's gonna be kind of the, the focus uh, to talk about both things that are going on right now as well as some things that will be getting started uh, probably in the next few months. Um, ward two, I'm, I'm guessing to a lot of you this is no surprise, is an extremely busy ward. There's a lot going on. Um, so there are a lot of um, projects that we wanna try to cover tonight just so folks, you know, you're kind of aware, you can make plans for things coming up. Um, so uh, all the presenters will take a couple of questions um, after their presentation. I'm going to ask them to limit it to two, maybe three if they're short questions, um, just so that we can get through all of the material for folks who may have to leave early. Um, if you have additional questions or if you have a question that is uh, maybe really specific to you or might be a little bit more involved, um, everyone will be here after the meeting, so feel free to, to grab us and um, we can talk, um, and if you do need to leave early or the person you need to talk to isn't here, uh, my card is on the table over there by the door. Grab it, um, shoot me an email, and I can connect you with whoever um, can answer your question or address your issue. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mayor Joe Curtitoni. He's gonna kind of give you some context as to why all of these things are happening right now. Right, thanks, Megan. Oh, good evening. It's great to see a uh, very large crowd recovering from the Red Sox World Series and all those late night games. It's pretty sad when a game gets over uh, early and it's 11.45 p.m. That was a final game. But it's great to see you all here, as Megan mentioned. 
Yeah, uh, we all know there's a lot of stuff happening every night in the city in terms of meetings and important zoning meeting tonight. So I know Alderman Scott's there, but uh, he may be joining us and that's what we're recording tonight. But it's great to see, one, so many people here and so many new people. For those of you, for the, this, is where, this is your first meeting, resident statistics. So we endeavor to empower you, giving you data and information on topic areas where the agenda is crafted with the input of the community and to ask you to be probative of that data and information, ask questions why, and think about the follow-up data or info you may want to have. Um, uh, given the fact that, uh, yeah, there is more construction than usual, I think that answer is pretty, uh, pretty clear in the city. We, uh, hearing from the community and where we are in that construction schedule, we thought it was very ripe and mature that we talk about the construction happening in the city and some of the other challenges and consequences and opportunities and goals that we'll achieve along that and answer any questions you have. But you can obviously see this is just a snapshot just from the last few years, the exponential increase in construction in terms of our uh, subterranean work around water, uh, sewer, big pipe replacement, uh, and maintenance programs, and streetscape construction across the city. It, it's big in terms of linear feet. It's a major increase in goal over Y. You know, so it's all kinds of construction, whether it's, uh, you know, water, uh, you know, uh, upgrades up in, uh, around Pearl Street, uh, that green line extension, I want to talk about why the time of this sort of impacts the, you know, exacerbates the impacts more now uh, than if it had stick to its regular schedule, what's going on on the Sum of a Laugh project, uh, the high school, so, you know, we get subterranean street improvement, water and sewer preventive maintenance, because a major vertical construction, municipal construction here, Sum of High School, uh, which we're really excited about, um, and even, uh, renovation projects like the West Branch Library. Uh, these are all important, and these are just city projects. So you have these horizontal projects, these subterranean projects, these vertical projects. That doesn't account even for this illustration, the private sector development projects happening around the city, or that might be happening in a neighboring city town that happens to border us. Uh, in the most densely populated city in New England, this has impacts on us every day. And I do want to apologize uh, to all of you and uh, thank you for your patience and your flexibility and say how sorry we are for any inconvenience and let you know we're going to be working and talk about the approach and how we're working daily and be monitors daily on a real-time basis the data the information the comments and the info giving you and trying to mitigate the inconvenience uh, the delays uh, the loss of any productivity and the stress that will come along with this i get it I drive my kids every day from school i leave from the northern part of somerville and ten hills just to go to the high school and the Kennedy School, and I curse the mayor uh, every, every time I'm on the street. So hopefully we'll get through this together. Um, so, you know, much of the construction, this is not by accident, folks. The only thing I would tell you is that, you know, for generations we've kicked the can of preventive maintenance far too long. Uh, and we've deliberately, in a very strategic way, thought about where we needed to make that major infrastructure improvement. And going back to other major projects, a high school is an important project. It was long overdue that this community supported with a major voter referendum. And the Green Line Extension project is more about a half a century in the making. I will just say that uh, this is 2018. The, the Green Line Extension, when we broke ground a few years ago, the first of many groundbreakings, was supposed to be completed. Right now, we're supposed to be testing cars. And if you recall, just a little context, uh, Governor Baker came into office. This was not his fault, uh, but that time was discovered. The project was uh, about a billion dollars over budget. And it was a billion dollars over budget because the state was utilizing a procurement tool uh, that really was the wrong type of tool that drove up the costs of oversight and management in the project. And it wasn't even, I would say, applied the right way. So there was a pause. There was a, re, a brutal redesign and re-procurement of the project. The good news is it is under construction and it is going to happen and it will be completed and approximately two years from now they'll be testing the green line cars on that track with a full opening implementation opening in the spring of 2021 all right but again that's 
impacting some of the other major infrastructure work we have to have happen because there's disruption and delay, as you've heard from the bridge closures, and Brad Ross and our Director of Transportation and Infrastructure and his team will be talking about that. So in addition, look, a lot of the major water and sewer pipes, some of these I just talked about, were built uh, and when this city broke away from Charlestown <laughs> in, in the late 1800s. And that's at the same time a lot of the city's housing stock that you see today, its homes, two and three families and so forth, were built. And that was the infrastructure to support the community's goals and, 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 and hopes at that point in time, but very little in terms of preventive maintenance or major infrastructure work until the present. Um, and a lot of that infrastructure was built with a, uh, I think, a hundred year uh, cycle, uh, life cycle, and it's not that it's all going to collapse, though some of it does collapse at times. Um, you know, much of what we're building out now it will be for a 50 year life cycle, but we're also putting a major investment in preventive maintenance and using new techniques to upgrade that infrastructure. It is critical for our everyday quality of life, for our sustainability goals, to unlock the growth we hope to have, uh, and that's why we're doing all the work we're doing. Um, but we know that living through this construction is not easy. It's not easy on our day-to-day -day lives, getting the kids to school, going to our job, trying to recreate, just walk and bike around the city in a safe manner, or even on our, our small businesses. Um, so knowing there's a lot of infrastructure, you know, this isn't an endeavor um, that we want to accomplish that comes cheap. You know, how do we, how do we pay for it? Um, well, some of it is paid, but the, a lot of it is paid through a variety of different sources. Uh, we seek to uh, um, achieve a lot of soft money, which is not soft, but money comes from other sources than the taxpayers here off our, on our operating budget, but from grants. So whether it's grants from uh, HUD at the federal level or uh, transportation money, the federal transportation money comes to our regional metropolitan planning organization, where, where some of it has a seat on. You can see we all, you know, you know, we're upwards of hundred millions of dollars there, other state and federal grants, or in the terms of the school money that we receive from the Massachusetts School Building Authority, or that we get allocated here from the Commonwealth to fix our sidewalks and streets. That's really important, and we use that money, we leverage it with other borrowing at the local level uh, to make sure we can accomplish these important goals. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, we're trying to achieve these goals. We're, you know, we're also collecting data about the everyday conditions of our buildings, our roads, of our sidewalks. Uh, we're collecting uh, and, and trying to gauge the life cycle of that infrastructure, determining what gets built when, where preventive maintenance gets done, and why we should undertake this major project. Uh, one of the, the things the city has never done, and we've done it recently in the last several years, is to implement a very robust street uh, improvement program, street uh, reconstruction improvement program in our sidewalks. Uh, what we found over time is, you know, not over time, what we really focused on is what the data tells us that base rehabilitation of a road, um, in other words, bringing the road down to the dirt, a real full base reconstruction of the road, is seven times more uh, costly than preventive maintenance. So if we're doing our work and we're using our resources wisely and we're investing in that roadway, uh, on your street, and we're doing whether we're doing some patchwork in a very strategic way, we're upgrading it every few years. Uh, it's going to have a greater life cycle, and it's going to cost us seven times less than it does now. What happened for many years uh, before our administration took office is the roads were done basically piecemeal, and we had to do it the same way before we had the data and the analysis to determine which streets get repaved, what sidewalks get replaced, which ADA ramps have to be installed. Uh, people would look at the street and said, yeah, that looks kind of bad, let's do it over. But there was no strategic or deliberate plan to get it done. We have a very robust plan on how to work doing that, and you'll hear from Brad Ross, and you'll hear from Rich Raich, the city's chief engineer, on what we're doing, and we're really excited. Uh, and you can see all this work is happening uh, across the city where we're doing nothing, or we're doing routine maintenance in the blue, and this is in your chart, and it's not color of prevention maintenance, or major base reconstruction. Uh, it's happening across the city again, alongside those other major projects. Um, so how does, uh, how does all this work that I'm alluding to or referencing, how does it fit into what our community and our community values? Well, in Summer Vision, which is our comprehensive community plan of what we want to be and who we want to be, by 2030, we had several strategic goals around that in terms of the amount of growth we wanted to create in the city where that growth would occur, our goals around sustainability, our goals around mobility. Uh, more specifically, we wanted to shift 
Uh, and when we adopted the plan, all new vehicle trips by 50% are more biking, walking, transportation. So how do we set the plane? How do we create the environment and invest in the infrastructure to make that happen? We want to expand open space by 125 new acres by 2030. Um, we want to create a net new 30,000 jobs, which means we need to bring in the commercial development to do that. But to do all that, we need to invest in, in infrastructure to improve our quality of life, to improve our environment, and to bring the growth necessary to invest in the services that we want. And, and this talks about it, you know, how to, why it's so important. It's for all these things we want to create. And all of these are connected. Infrastructure plays a role in every single one of these strategic goals aligned with our community value, overarching value, making consumable an exceptional place to live, work, uh, play, and raise a family. And we evaluate these goals, now it's been several years, uh, as time's gone on. For example, we know our housing goal, which back um, several years ago, we had stated as a community we're gonna create 6,000 additional new units of housing, over which a significant portion would be permanently affordable. Well, in a time of housing emergency with the greater Boston region, that number probably needs to be increased exponentially. You may have seen the Metro Mayor's Coalition, which are the 15 cities of the inner core, which I co-chair, we announced the first ever uh, regional production goal for that region of 185,000 new units by 2030, and uh, some of them will play a, take a major lead there. Uh, we are in a housing emergency, so that data several years ago may not may not really fit the reality today. Or, you know, we finally developed our climate forward plan, which we're going to announce soon to meet a uh, new sustain, our sustainability goal of being carbon neutral by 2040, which we are 2050, which we announced a few years ago. Or going back to that mobility goal, the shifting new, all new vehicle trips by 50% to more biking, walking, public transportation makes sense today. There are many of you activists and advocates in this community who we agree with say, man, that goal should be higher. And it goes back to another value we believe in. You know, if you build a city for cars, you plan a city for cars, that's what you're going to get. Uh, and we're starting to learn important quality of life and health lessons about you know, being bold about those goals. And the worst case or best case scenario, 30 years from now, it really depends on what we're gonna to do today. So we re-examine these goals continuously to reset them align with our orient them value. And again, infrastructure, that investment is critical here along with Vision Zero and other goals to, to, to accomplish these things. Um, yeah, but how do we live to it? You know, how do we plan and live through this very um, difficult time? And again, it's gonna to be tough. Uh, there are no optimal options, let's be clear. I was watching a movie where in the, where in the movie they were, they were discussing a, a plan to rescue some hostages and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the person who's gonna lead that chat said, we have no good options. This is our best worst option. <laughs> and, and, and I don't know to mean to paint the Bleak picture, we are going to be disrupted with this construction. We're disrupted now. It's going to be stressful. There are other consequences, and I'll talk about my other favorite topic shortly, which is rodents and, and, and noise. Uh, but we need to work and collectively gather data on a real-time basis. We need to hear from you, and we will be side by side with all of you getting through this, and we will get through this, and our lives will be better at the other end. That I can guarantee, because we're a city where you can move safely, more safely. You can ride your bike, you'll be able to walk. We'll have the Green Line extension. We'll take 25,000 cars off the road uh, every day. Um, we'll, we'll bring justice in terms of uh, mobility justice and transportation equity to folks who haven't had it to our environmental justice communities. But it's gonna be a lot of work getting there. So how do we live through that? How do we get through the traffic and noise? How do we balance uh, the impacts on all of you and all of us and our neighborhoods while trying to get these projects through on time as they're all happening at once. Uh, your input is critical. So we've set up uh, a central email address for any construction concerns. Construction at somerville.ma.gov. This is a great newsletter. It gives you real-time updates on what's happening, street closures, any unforeseen developments. This is where you can get it. Uh, you can get that and it has to be put on the list. Uh, we also, the Board of Alderman was great in supporting three important positions. And uh, I think everyone's here tonight, if you can just uh, stand up. Erica Mace, uh, she's our Construction Public Information Officer. There's Erica. Uh, Jesse Moose, our Construction Liaison and Compliance Manager. And Viola Augustine, uh, Green Line Extension Project Liaison. And, uh, she's at her desk, doing her job. Good. Um, and, you know, because we're trying to coordinate the communication, uh, work with the project teams. For example, the Green Line Extension, that's not our project. 
but they are making decisions every day in the field as they get approximately four to 500 workers in the corridor every day. And we need to understand real time if anything's gonna change and impact, again, street closures, neighborhoods, noise, and, and so forth. These folks are on the ground every day. So the, we have set up the, the portal for you to get us your concerns. And always you can just call 311 as well and tell us anything going on. Now, on rodents, on noise, you don't know what's happening, information, we'll get you that in real time. I'm sorry, um, I think I broke this. <laughs> fix it. All right, good. All right, so, which leads to one of the things we're gonna see more and more. We believe in, we collect data real time every day. We try to measure everything from our operational performance, our financial performance, and basic quality of life uh, data. Uh, rodents, um, they live here with us. <laughs> we're not gonna get rid of all the rats. Uh, you probably don't wanna get rid of an entire species because another one will dominate. However, rodents are real and we've seen different um, different levels of rodent infestation going back over the last several years. We put a strong emphasis on measuring. Your input on this is critical. Uh, and I'll explain why in more detail. Uh, but during construction season, this issue can be exacerbated. Uh, if, if there's a nest that's disrupted, uh, you'll see rodents push into a different part of the neighborhood that'll be displaced. Uh, I'll talk about some of the resources we brought in to monitor this, but just to give you a little snapshot on data over the last several years, we hit a really critical high point uh, around 2012 and 13, um, it's, and it says in mild win winter, and I'll talk about some of the interventions we did. Then we had a statistically significant drop in rodent reporting. Now this is reporting. Not every site of rodent site is reported, but there's a robust universe of what is being reported that this data is accurate. And then we've seen an uptick now. Well, again, in mild winters have an impact on the rodent population. If it's colder, we, we, there is a correlation in terms of the rodent infestation will drop. If it's warmer, we're gonna see them high. One of the other things we did a few years ago, um, we discovered, and this should be no surprise, and you know, the things that keep rodents around are a water source. So if you have a pet, I have two dogs, and you have that bull or ish in the backyard with food, take that food in at night. If you keep the water in, put it in a plant or tree on the, on the base, don't leave it out because water is a source that keeps them alive. The other is, you know, the food source and more particularly um, how, you know, we used to store our trash here in the community residence. You, everyone had a different container. Some people had just their plastic bags. Well, rodents can eat through most of those containers and get to the bags. So we went uh, right around here to a uniformed um, trash container policy, which we gave everyone of those cans, you know, those trash bins you have now, along with the recycle bins, and that hardened where the food source was, and that had an impact, a positive impact on the rodent population, as well as we began to, we reevaluated our approach to licensing and permitting all the dumpsters in the city. We found that many dumpsters were the, the same dumpsters, they were corroded, and, the, and they'd be leaking, uh, and, and rodents had found their way in, and they were havens uh, for large nests, and so we caused everyone to come in and reapply for their dumpster licenses and permits, and we saw that have a great impact. And then some of the winters were colder. So that, this was statistically significant. Pick up some mild winters, and here we are now, and now you put the construction on top of it, we're starting to get more calls, and you're probably seeing it in your yards. I have a problem in my neighborhood. A neighbor's house, they're in my house. One property, um, one property with a rodent infestation, will it, it won't just be on one property. Guaranteed it's gone out to several, and it's a pretty wide uh, radius. So calling 311 every time you see one's important. We will deploy inspectors, we will deploy resources, and we try to determine the source of that infestation. It's not easy. It's really chasing a ping pong ball and a, and a hurricane, but it's really important. We, we have other residential road and abatement programs we can apply. We, will, we have problem properties still here in the city. We have some absentee landlords who are recalcitrant in terms of their, school, their duties and responsibilities on health and code um, ordinances, and we go after them as well. But even if you think you've seen the same rat five times, we want five calls, five emails. We, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we want them, yep. We, we've seen them, and they are, they definitely, especially with the green line, they come off the rail bed, 
Uh, but again, I want to talk about, you know, we are monitoring this. Uh, we have heat maps on this, so, you know, certainly in Union Square, we have no issue where uh, the MBTA uh, and, and, and that site and the areas around uh, Brick Bottom and um, this was at Ten Hills uh, where I was and, we, and uh, there were some things happening off the river there as well. Um, and, but you know, if you see one, it bothers you. Whether you have one or a hundred, we get it, we want it. It's important, that information does guide us, but we've got ISD is coordinating with the MBTA and the Housing Authority, uh, and, and some addresses here on Ward 2. Uh, but we've seen, uh, this is an increase again from, seven, from, from 17 till now, so it is, it is significant in these areas. So we see that and we are deploying resources. We um, actually, conducted a baseline assessment of all the activity on, on these major construction projects. We actually brought in, uh, created a new position called the Environmental Health Coordinator, and that hired yet? Is that hired yet? Or close to being hired? We're, hired. Yeah. We're on the ninth thing about the offer of that position, it's in process. We also brought in the renowned rat expert in the U.S., and, and it's Dr. Corrigan. Uh, we literally did a tour around here in Union Square, and again, uh, it's really interesting. I never thought I'd have to learn about rats in this job, but it really is, and including walking the Green Line corridor, we have a better understanding of how infestation occurs or where nests uh, tend to expand and why, and that's given us a lot of great information, and there's great coordination between projects like the Green Line, the high school, and the city staff and inspectors on this. But again, we know this is real. We know this is troublesome, and we're, pro we're deploying resources towards it. Um, the other um, piece of it is, you know, the impact on small businesses uh, in our city. You know, the majority of businesses in this metro area, as it states, has, you know, fewer, have fewer than 20 employees. And that's no different right here in this neighborhood, down in Union Square, another, and, and another aligning corridors, and the study, uh, um, you know, certainly improve all the data shows that when you improve, improve your streetscape, you know, the, the greater your bike scores and your walkability, the greater economic impact to, to smaller businesses. We saw that with our investments even during the, the Great Recession, small businesses were able to sustain and do well. But, you know, they're going to, you know, they will be impacted during construction. You can lose anywhere from 20 to 50 percent of revenues. So it's making sure we're working with small businesses that they're able to bridge these difficult times like us and our quality of life but in terms of their operation until these projects are done. Because when they're done, they'll do really well. So uh, we've, what, uh, I was Tom here? I was Tom Galligani here. Our economic development uh, director, Tom Galligani, and his team there, we uh, created a small, on our small business report, we've done a lot of targeted outreach. Our team has with many small businesses. We're doing a lot of work to advertise and promote our squares like the Loyal to Local uh, campaign, the Ball on Ball Square, uh, celebrate still these squares, even during construction, there's destinations, uh, trying to help them bridge and provide communication and best practices so they're not losing customers and actually still growing, albeit expert, you know, uh, not exponentially, but incrementally than that time so that when we are completed with these projects, they're well underway, but they're not going backwards during that construction time. Uh, but we recognize that, that is uh, not an easy task at the time, but we are encouraging people to patronize and encourage others to do the same. Um, there are many events that will continue to do the same events across the city, the civic events that have great and positive uh, economic impact on them, and, and, and dealing with them on transportation uh, issues uh, and helping their consumers and customers to stay uh, in the corridor. Um, so there's a lot going on. There is a lot of construction. Again, I want to apologize to all of you. I say how sorry I am for the inconvenience, the stress, and the disruption of your daily lives. It won't be easy. Uh, as you see and you've heard and you're reading and see the slides moving forward of the projects just around War II. And we're only a city of 4.1 square miles, so if something's happening in West Somerville and there's a major street closure, you're going to feel it here. I mean, we were just uh, repaving Cedar Street, and you, in the center of the city, you felt the ripple effect across the city. We're also, across the city. We're also going to do a lot of advertising and new public service announcements for those who want to just come through Somerville and not stop here. We're basically telling them, if you have no business to, to come through here, you don't want to come here for a couple of years. <laughs> if you want to go to Kendall Square, you should take this other route. We're going to be pretty candid and bold about it. The study shows that, you know, we learned this in the MBA from MassDOT, uh, the state's the transportation department, their work on Commonwealth Ave, that, that, that type of message and had an impact in, 
and diffusing uh, driver community interest to just cut through a community. So we're going to do a lot of P uh, work on PSAs and other public announcements to, uh, throughout this time period to make sure that people are coming here coming for destination purposes uh, and not just to cut through to get to their place of employment or, uh, uh, or to some other community. So that's where I am. I just wanted to set the context for this conversation you're going to hear from Brad and others. Uh, I can take a couple of questions now. I will not be going anywhere. I'll be right here to listen to the rest of the presentation. But if you have a couple of points or comments you'd like to make now, I'm glad to take them. If not, I'm going to hand it off. It's going to be Rich or Brad. Dan. Right. Okay. Yes. No, please. Yep. Thank you. Question is on Sullivan Square, which is a mess before any of this starts. What's going to happen with all this and with the casino, which is set to open in spring of 2019? Actually, they were a month ahead. They're going to open. Um, it's a concern. It has been a concern, uh, notwithstanding the fact that I opposed gaming and opposed the casino. And one of the things we, and we didn't stop the casino, one of the things we have to achieve is greater mitigation or resources towards traffic mitigation. It's going to be hard. We are part of a major working group, which includes the casinos. On this point, they've been honest brokers and working with us because I think we, they, they do recognize that you know, we need to work together because a greater congestion or delay in the square or the circle, in that corridor on Route 99 and, the, and bordering some of Cambridge, Boston, and Everett, it only hurts their operations as well. Um, and I'm going to have Brad talk about that shortly. So we are coming out, recommendations are coming out for major investment. Uh, around that corridor uh, that could help, but we'll have to convince the Commonwealth uh, to participate in that. And you should know that the casino has had to, was required to put forth major money for infrastructure improvements, uh, not just in the roadways, but also to improve the Orange Line services and the headways along the Orange Line. Uh, but let me have Brad just answer that more specifically because he's in those conversations. Sure. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, just super quick, uh, whenever it, just like any private sector entity, is obligated to mitigate some of the impacts of their investments. And we, of course, always thought that maybe they should do more, uh, and some of our arguments were listened to and adopted, and others weren't. One of the ones that they're actually completing right now, help is on the way, about a month from now, the Sullivan Square construction that you see is going to be completed. They're building dedicated bus lanes. So actually a lot of those bus routes, whether it's Route 91, CT2, that come out of our neighborhood down here and get over to Sullivan for transfers, they're going to have better dedicated right of way and queue jumping privileges. They'll get around certain signals when was obligated by the state to do stuff like that. There's some new protected and, uh, bike facilities that are being installed by the developer. So that big push of construction, and we know it's been really, really lousy this summer, this fall. Um, help is on the way, and that's going to come to a kind of a close of the chapter in the next month or so. Brad, not to get off topic, but stay right here one second, because the question I've gotten for folks, because you've heard of, and it's great, it's great to see some of our partner communities catch up with some of those mobility goals. Some of them, have, uh, many, some of them now start to implement dedicated bus lanes, saw that around and so forth, and I've had gotten some social media questions, why not, some of them, where are we? They're coming, they're coming, I'll have Brad answer this, and they're gonna come soon. We have a lot of major roadway infrastructure work happening, and we're just trying to be strategic. We can't shut down every road right now and every school future, for instance, look to Davis Square. We couldn't do that today. We'll really choke the city up because we have uh, all the work happening on, on some of Lab East, the Green Line, all these other projects we talked about, and we really want to monitor and measure the traffic congestion and mobility, and so that is coming. When Brad comes up and talks, if we just mentioned dedicated bus lanes and where we are with that, and you're going to see more protected bike lanes coming as well as with all these projects. Okay. Yes. Thanks for the question. It actually was brought up earlier just in the sort of pre-conversation. Brett, want to talk about that? 
Sure, thanks. And, and again, we can talk about this afterwards as well. I see many familiar faces. We've been trying to do outreach with you all, with your neighbors, with Alderman Scott, Alderman Hirsch, so many others, to try to make sure that Summerall has a voice in issues on the Cambridge side of the border. Um, so for folks who have not been following this issue, there was a terrible, terrible tragedy a year and a half ago. A young woman named Amanda Phillips was killed in Inman Square in a adoring incident. She was riding her bicycle. She actually had you know, some Summerville roots and some Summerville history. Uh, and she was killed by a vehicle. The city of Cambridge had been going through a process to try to fix Inman Square. Statistically, it's actually one of the least safe locations in terms of these high crash clusters. It, the geometry is just so difficult, right? There's so many conflicting movements of so many people, no matter how you get around. A lot of people try to traverse the square, not unlike Union, right? Not unlike Davis, many other parts of Somerville. And so Amanda's death really uh, focused the issues for the city of Cambridge, and they tried to advance a series of, of changes to the geometry and the signalization of Inman Square to make everybody safer. This is not about a giveaway to any one user group, right? Everybody starts their trip no matter what they are as a pedestrian, whether you're hopping in a car, hopping on a bus, hopping on a bicycle, right? We are all human beings and using the streets, and when vehicles move slowly in an organized fashion, we all benefit. Cambridge is working on this process. They've been doing it with their stakeholders. We heard from you all and from your elected officials that it was important that our staff and our community had a voice in that process. And folks will remember that early on, they had a, a rather ham-handed proposal to simply unilaterally change the directionality of Springfield Street up into the neighborhood. And all of you said, not so fast, please. Mike Tremblay, my senior transportation planner, myself and many others have been advocating, sitting down with the staff there. And, and to Cambridge's credit, they've adjusted their plans We've tried to get them to make sure they're sharing information. They've had lots and lots of community meetings. Again, many of you and your neighbors have attended those. Um, the whole story is not yet written. They just cleared an important procedural hurdle and we'll be moving into the next phase of their design. Um, so it's been a couple of weeks since I've talked with counterparts and I'd be happy to check in on that. I think we should anticipate that construction will start on that project in calendar 19. Don't know if it's gonna be spring or summer but the construction will start. If it's anything like stuff that we've been dealing with around here, it's gonna take a year plus uh, before any of those, any traffic patterns change. And we'll continue to try to monitor their proposals uh, and see if there's ways to understand and mitigate the changes. Um, Left-hand turn restrictions on Springfield, that burden oak, that burden prospect, we know that these are downstream kind of implications. So we wanna to try to, as the mayor said, have quantitative data, have legitimate and genuine conversations with neighbors uh, about those implications. So stay tuned on that and we'll be happy to arrange for another session or better kind of web presence, cross posting and materials. And we can talk about the bus conversation if that's okay, since I've been rattling on now uh, in the context of some of those other things that the mayor mentioned in terms of bus rapid transit. So more to come on, on, on Inman, thanks. Thanks, Brad. Um, I'm gonna pass the mic. I'm not going anywhere. I'll be here just to keep the meeting moving along and listen in and chime in if necessary. Um, so Dan, Dan's gonna get up in a second and talk about uh, an upcoming project in Union Square that um, if you haven't heard about, I don't wanna spoil the surprise. I'll let him tell you about it. Um, but it, it may have some impacts on business. Um, and I know some of the folks from Union Square Main Streets are here working, yeah. Are, are here. Um, they are working on uh, some events to bolster businesses, especially around the holidays. We're helping coordinate on some of those. So um, keep an eye out uh, for those. Um, and if you want to stay involved and, and support your super local Union Square businesses, I know they, they have a newsletter um, and they have a social media presence. So, um, you know, please check that out and stay tuned. Um, and now for, for anyone who hasn't heard the news, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Dan. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you all for coming. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Dan Amelin. I am the project manager uh, for the Somerville Ave and Union Square project. I actually started with the city earlier this year, uh, late summer, and I'm, I'm happy to quickly give a report here on, on our progress to date, what the project is, and what that means for you folks here tonight. Uh, that being said, before I get into it, this is just a, a, a quick chart here showing all the construction projects going on in and around the area. Uh, my primary focus and what I'll be talking about tonight is specifically for Somerville Ave, but you can see here on this map we have a combination of the, the ongoing project in Union Square, uh, some Spring Hill sewer separation, <clears throat> uh, Nunziato stormwater storage, and these are all tied together in the city's effort to improve our aging infrastructure. Uh, so that being said, just a quick project overview for those who don't know. Uh, this project was designed over the course of multiple years. Uh, the implementation and start of construction was earlier this year, uh, roughly April, May. 
Uh, so we've been under construction now for roughly six months. And for many of those uh, that live in the area and, and see what's happening every day, the work that's been going on to date uh, has been a bit variable. Uh, some of these work zones have shifted and moved throughout the past couple months. And really that's in preparation for the work that's about to come. Uh, one of the main goals of this project is to provide enough stormwater uh, drainage capacity for the city of Somerville. The Union Square, Somerville Ave corridor drains roughly 60% of the city. And uh, our, our existing sewer pipes, our water lines, they're all roughly 100, 120 years old. Uh, they're in great shape for being that old, but again, uh, kind of curtailing on what the mayor said, you know, it, this is our chance to be proactive and address uh, the, the future, you know, for many years to come. Uh, as I mentioned, between the installation of a new stormwater box culvert, uh, it's about 14 feet wide by six feet tall. It'll be extending from Union Square all the way down beyond uh, McGrath Highway. It'll provide a capacity of roughly 800,000 gallons of uh, stormwater a day. And, and tying on to that, the existing system we have now is a combined sewer. It combines wastewater with stormwater. And again, with future development taking place here, we want to be able to separate those two for a, a clean and safe environment and to provide new utilities for uh, existing residents and, and you know, the, the influx of population to come. So this is just kind of a quick sketch showing you really where our limits are. Um, this project will be going on for quite a while. Our anticipated end date is 2021. Uh, really once we get underway here after the next six months or so we are anticipating about moving a little under 10 feet a day so if you can understand the size and scope of this project uh, we're trying to get it done as quickly as possible and to minimize impacts to you folks here tonight and, and all your neighbors starting in November which is right around the corner uh, we are going to be having this work zone set up here in the heart of the square this is a major construction area, it's a major work zone. It's gonna be stationary for approximately six months from, again, November roughly to about April. The work that needs to take place here is integral to the whole project. It's really our, uh, really our starting point to separate sanitary water and, and storm water. Uh, this hole here, or rather, excuse me, this little sketch here, that's gonna end up being a rather large hole while we install just massive concrete structures. Really as, as the initial part of the stormwater box culvert installation that's gonna be occurring over the next two years or so. Uh, just some things that, to note uh, regarding impacts. Yes, it looks like a substantial closure, but between meeting with you know, multiple city departments, the MBTA, uh, fire, police, emergency services, what we have shown here and what we plan to do is, is for any traffic traveling westbound on Somerville Ave, you'll be able to maintain that one lane up to Bow Street uh, unimpeded. The biggest impact would be Somerville Ave eastbound. Uh, you will not be able to proceed through the square. For folks traveling through the square, you know, any through traffic, you'll be rerouted back on a Bow Street. And in the next slide, I can show you what our detour plan is. But again, this, this work here, uh, while it is a significant impact, we maintain all our pedestrian access, maintain bicycle lanes, and really just limit the amount of traffic coming eastbound on Somerville Ave. So the sketch you're looking at here is, is one of our detour maps. It is available on the city website. If you don't have a copy or, or you need one, please feel free to reach out either at our construction email or 311. Uh, what this is showing is our plan to use Dane Street as a detour route for these six months. Uh, the decision to use Dane Street, again, it, it culminates from years of design and, and coordination and working with multiple departments, the MBTA, uh, in order to uh, provide a similar level of service that's currently ex in existence today. Uh, one thing I do want to note, however, for any folks traveling to Union Square, anyone who's looking to you know, have, maintain access to businesses, restaurants, so on and so forth, you will have that ability. With this work zone, we're only going to be removing four parking spots. Uh, the majority of the parking in Union Square will remain intact for you know, anyone looking to travel there. Um, this dotted red line here shows that you, know, you will be able to proceed eastbound up until the square before you're rooted back onto Bow Street. The idea here is that, you know, again, for any through traffic during morning hour, you know, afternoon hour commutes, 
Dean Street is the preferred detour route. Uh, based on the conditions of the road, it is wide enough to accommodate both a bus and vehicle traveling in opposite directions. Both sides of Dean Street uh, and Somerville Ave and Washington Street are currently signalized. Uh, this will go into effect uh, relatively soon, a couple weeks here. And uh, one thing I do want to note, you know, that we've received this question and I want to address it now. The city is uh, looking into other alternatives and ongoing traffic analysis is being performed for Hawkins Street uh, with the, the primary factor being we want to maintain emergency services for anyone who needs them, uh, whether it be fire, police, ambulance, so on and so forth. Uh, so that being said, again, uh, we are looking at al al alternatives uh, just for those reasons. However, Dane Street will be the detour route for the next six months. Moving on to bus route detours and stop relocations. Uh, again, this, a lot of this information I'm presenting here tonight has been vetted through the MBTA. It's, it's some of it's preferential for them and really logistically for, for bus movements and providing you know, a safe environment for all pedestrians, bicyclists, you know, really everyone. What we show here, since uh, we do have our road closure and you can't proceed eastbound on Somerville Ave, the 87 inbound, and you can see it kind of up here by, uh, excuse me, Market Basket, I believe. Uh, that will be, that stop that's currently in existence will remain there. Uh, we will be asking folks, you know, these, these next three stops on Somerville Ave eastbound will be closed as the bus uses the Dane Street detour. Uh, we've also worked with the T to include uh, for the 85 inbound to combine existing 87 stops with 85 to reduce the, the distance that folks have to walk in an effort to, to minimize impacts for commuters. Uh, also, I, I do want to mention the 85 outbound route. Uh, instead of proceeding north through uh, Webster Ave, through the square, it'll be going up Prospect Street, making a left turn. All the stops are unaffected, and they'll remain in place during this detour route. Uh, again, this is, uh, if, if the city needs to make adjustments, it will. However, this plan in place is, has been thoroughly vetted and uh, will be proceeding in a few weeks. Uh, that being said, uh, I have a couple of minutes for questions. If anyone has a question, yes, sir. What about the traffic coming into the square from the opposite direction? Which? From, uh, yeah, from McGrath, onto, like from the McGrath way on Somerville. So westbound traffic on Somerville Ave? Yeah. Uh, unaffected. You'll be able to proceed straight onto Washington Street or, or maintain that, that right onto Bow Street. So those lanes will be open for traffic. Yes. So with all the tree construction, one of the issues we had was, uh, even though we had plans like this, they weren't nearly as well thought out, so this is awesome. Traffic still tried to cut through residential neighborhoods that just can't support that much traffic. So my street, two cars cannot pass. They get stuck and they hop at each other. Um, I had, I don't even know how many mornings the first summer with the tree construction where they just would sit there for minutes. So. How are we going to keep cars on the seashore and out of residential neighborhoods? It's a great question. And our, our plans to do so and, and address that, uh, we have what, what I don't show here tonight. We have an extensive signage plan, uh, markings plan, you know, really stemming out from Union Square all the way out to Porter, all the way to McGrath, you know, really covering the whole city, advising drivers, you know, through traffic to seek an alternate route. Uh, and, and through the signage, we have several VMS boards placed strategically throughout the city to encourage drivers to take the detour route. Uh, really, it'll save them time instead of trying to cut through side streets. But in addition, and I don't want to speak on behalf of the police department, but we have the ability to prioritize details should we need to, just to ensure that people are taking the right directions and the right steps without having to impact local abutters. Yeah, let, me just, let me just add to that, because that's a good point. One of the things we're cognizant of us, not, notwithstanding some signalization improvements, signage upgrades, we're still going to get some bleeding into different intersections and streets. You know, we know major intersections, you can have traffic queuing up, and everything gets bogged down, and that throws the whole thing out of whack. So uh, I know the chief is here, you got the, the, the police department's tuned in. It's not just on this project, but around where the bridge closures are. We want to get some bodies on the ground and some of those tricky intersections. So input and feedback 
throughout this process and what you're seeing on the ground in real time, what your experience is, we'll react to that and we're going to be prepared or keeping in common to deploy resources accordingly. We need to get a body there, someone to direct traffic, we'll do that. Because uh, not all the signage and synchronization of lights is going to solve all those issues. <laughs> Area of the city, so the city's doing the education part of it and the engineering part of it, and the police will be there to do the enforcement part. So we've got to lean on the education, we've got to lean on the engineering, but where enforcement needs to be done, we're ready to deploy to each of these projects. I'll take one more question, and I, before before you ask, I do want to mention again, I'm not going anywhere either. I'll be here all night and uh, hang around afterwards. So if you do have other questions, please feel free to seek me out. Yes, go ahead. Point out though is that even currently in Union Square, um, going through Union Square with construction, these people there, you still have cars that like do every possible thing, get a left lane to go right, you know, turn right to just cut through traffic. And you know, it would be great, I think, to like get enforcement, like actually meant ticketing too. I mean, it just you know, it, it just seemed like when, you know, I was there on Friday, it took 30 minutes to get through the square. And part of why it took so long is because of, like, you know, people in cars and patient people cutting through and also blocking the Bow Street, Webster, and Kirkland, Washington. Um, it was great long. No. And, and there were police people, like, moving people on. But the fact is, is that, you know, that the concern is always to get the traffic moving rather than, you know, penalizing people that are actually causing the issues. You know, it's a point where we take, we've been talking to the detail office as well as well about traffic unit. And they are reporting back to us that they are seeing some more aggressive driving as traffic builds up and people try to get through these congested areas. But they, we're on pace this year to like 10,000 moving, moving violations for, for people operating motor vehicles. So we are writing citations. We are out there, they're writing citations. So the officer, you know, is, is trying to educate, but we're going to be enforcing it and taking corrective action because your point is taken is it, it's dangerous for people leaving a lane of travel to move further up. And you've got bicycles on the road, pedestrians on the road, kids crossing, go to school, in the stress. So we're very cognizant of that. And if we're going to really increase our enforcement, then I think it's necessary to your point. So just real quick, uh, some of your concerns I want to attribute to the fact that our work zones in preparation for this upcoming work have been so variable and changing uh, that I really do believe once we actually get into this work zone and it's stationary for six months, you know, less of that will be occurring. So, and again, it, it, our goal is to minimize impacts to businesses and residents. Should you have any concerns, please feel free to reach out to the city and we'll, we'll do our best to address them. Uh, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to transportation. Oh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Rich Raish. So, we are sending the same message to all seven wards. We already told Ward 1, we're telling Ward 7. That's part of our outreach program. Uh, we're not just telling you because you're the ones most directly impacted. We're putting this word out citywide into our neighboring cities so that everyone understands that this is coming and to stay away. Um, unless you're here, Unless you're here to frequent one of the businesses, in which case we're going to accommodate you and find parking for you. Uh, if, if, if you're trying to get through, then we're going to discourage you. If your destination is Union Square, come on down. Uh, the other piece of good news is that uh, as we... Oh, now I broke it. Um, as we progress at, you know, 10 feet a month or whatever it is, once we get into the box culvert down on uh, Somerville Ave, Somerville Ave isn't going to be the only one that gets a, uh, a courtside view of uh, urban renewal as we uh, upgrade our century-old uh, system. The, the next thing, and again, what we are about now in engineering is getting the word out and having everyone understand why it is what we're doing and getting your input to help us do it better for you. The next stages of infrastructural renewal are both upstream and downstream of Somerville Ave. Downstream, most uh, notably, is our connection to the MBTA Green Line uh, uh, drainage system. So, most of you already know the Millage River used to come all the way into Union Square and that's how water got out of most of Somerville. In 1876, Millage River was filled. Uh, Somerville, Cambridge, and Boston filled that whole wetlands area. There was one pipe to get water out. 
That has been the choking point for the past century plus. Matter of fact, the first set of pipes that were built around 18, you know, 1850s to 1880s, by the time they got to 1890s in Somerville, they already knew that those pipes weren't big enough and were building second sets of pipes in the streets to deal with flooding issues. But that one pipe was then our, our choke point for the next century. The MBTA is on the rail corridor. Rail corridors are notorious for being insular and not letting anyone outside into there right away. They had their own drainage system for a century. When they needed money to make the GLX project a, a success, we negotiated rights to that drainage. We broke a, a century old barrier and got into that drainage system. We now have a second pipe for the first time since 1876. And our project to connect into it is down at Art Farm. We're going to put a stormwater pump station that connects to the end of this very big pipe we're putting down Somerville Ave. We're going to pump into the GLX system and they're going to take some of our stormwater out. The route for the force main from that pump station in Art Farm is, is down Linwood and up Fitchburg. There is no other way to go. Our one entry point into the GLX system is right there at the end of Fitchburg. Uh, that's just the, the configuration of the system. That's where we can punch into their system and pump in. We are going out to request for proposals or actually request for uh, qualifications uh, for a design team for that. As a matter of fact, I believe it hit the streets today. Uh, we'll be interviewing candidates uh, for engineers and architects for that team over the coming month. We hope to sign up that contract for professional services by January 1. Very shortly after we do some of the preliminary engineering work, we're going to do community outreach. We want to talk to the people down in Brick Bottom in this neighborhood and make sure that we deliver a project that not only functions for us to move stormwater, but also upgrades the infrastructure down in that area to that neighborhood satisfaction. We're going to be putting a force main down those roads. Once we're done, we're going to do the streetscape on those roads. We're going to give you sidewalks for an area that never had sidewalks. We're going to be able to do mobility, move people and water at the same place. Uphill, we're finally doing sewer separation. Anybody who lives in these areas, we know we're prone to localized flooding. We're solving that problem. Uh, we, anyone who lives on Lake Street for the past couple of weeks knows the pain of having a century old pipe. For almost two weeks, the sewer department's contractor, this isn't planned work, this is emergency response work. The pipe collapsed and they were chasing that for over two weeks. Emergency response is not the way to fix these pipes. You want to do it proactively. <clears throat> so we're updating the pipes in this upstream uh, area. We have a separate RFQ for engineering going out at the same time. I like to do things in bulk. Uh, and, and so we'll uh, sign up an engineer for that. Uh, we're gonna do, this is going to be a longer project. Uh, we're going to segment this out over a, a few years. But the same deal. We're going in. We're renewing the, the infrastructure. We're also renewing our surface uh, infrastructure. Green stormwater infrastructure is going to be very much knit into the, the fabric of how we manage stormwater. So street trees aren't just street trees, they are benefiting from stormwater, they're also managing our stormwater. And uh, we'll have public outreach so that as we design these projects we have uh, input from the neighborhoods on, on what these things look like. So again, we've got the, uh, the construction at SomervilleMA.gov uh, uh, alerts to know that what, uh, when we're going out there with the heavy equipment and constructing, we'll also be plugging our public outreach for the next phase, for the design phase, so that we're, we're way out and we get your, your input and we're designing what it is uh, that Somerville wants, needs, and deserves. And beyond that, uh, we're in the very early planning stages for uh, the, the rest of Ward 2 down here along the Cambridge line. We still have some legacy flooding issues down here. A little bit different solutions we're going to have to deliver for that. Those are uh, very early planning. Uh, we're, we're hoping to vet out some conceptuals over the, the coming year uh, and then be able to, to talk to the neighborhoods about moving that into design and then finally into construction. Hopefully sometime uh, by the, I, I might still have some dark hair by the time that all happens. So uh, maybe take uh, one question or two questions and then pass it off to, to Brad for uh, some transportation information. I stunned you all, right? Yes, please. Bottom resident, yes, we're, we're all we're horrified that you know that Linwood to Fitchburg, and we've been talking to people who keep, keep saying there are other uh, options, like go Chestnut to would dig up a smaller part of Fitchburg. 
We have parking issues, because those are all spaces that you're going to be tearing up. And we also have historic cobblestone that we'd like to maintain and keep. Yeah, so this is precisely the type of a conversation that we need to have. So from my perspective, Linwood or Chestnut is a toss-up. We could do either. The, the, the critical piece is that last piece of Fitchburg where it's going to interact with the uh, community path that GLX is, is building. So if we're better off doing the second block and not the first block, uh, we, we can talk about that. Uh, acknowledging that whichever street we dig up is the street that gets sidewalks. So that's, I think, part of the conversation that we want to have. When do you plan on having the conversation? I mean, it's, it's frustrating that, that you're saying this is the only option and we're going to go with the community outside At that point, the decision's made. Well, so again, the, 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 there, are, there are varying degrees of, of, um, of, of what has to happen. Again, that last piece of, Fit, of Fitchburg is the only immovable object. Uh, but Chestnut or Linwood or what the surrounding area looks like, that's, uh, that's all part of the conversation. Thanks, Rich. It was a hard act to follow. Um, folks, uh, most of you have heard me rattle on for Year after year of Resistat cycles, my name is Brad Ross, and I'm a Somerville resident. I live way over on the west side, just off of North Street. I'm a Somerville dad. I look forward to sending my three-year-old to the great public schools here in Somerville. It's just a couple short years. He just celebrated his third birthday. Like Megan said, like Rich, like Jesse Moose, our fantastic construction appliance officer, um, we're Somerville residents. We're here in the pool swimming with you. We are living these realities just like you are. It's our tax dollar. It's our commutes. It's the small businesses that we love. It's our kids' future as we think about building the high school uh, and putting them on the green line to get there. Um, so please understand, as the mayor said, uh, these are challenging moments, but these are good moments for communities to have. Most communities in America do not have the opportunities that Somerville has to renew its infrastructure and to do 50 years worth of work in just five or 10 years. We have kicked the can down the road as a society for far too long. Um, so I'm here to talk about a couple of things. Um, you know, Rich was talking a little bit about the way that we get around. If you can read this on your, um, your handout, uh, it's probably a little bit easier. But you know, the mayor's a data hound. He demands that we manage, that we measure things so that we can manage them effectively. And one of the fun things that our team has been able to bring to the table over the last few months is what we call you know, travel demand, mode share. Are people getting around primarily by automobiles, by bicycle, by bus, by walking? And we have actually been counting pedestrian and bicycle riders at the same 40 locations in the city for 10 years straight. More recently, we have implemented a real iterative, quantitative way to count cars. So folks on Perry Street, on Concord Ave, uh, on many other streets in the neighborhood have seen those little traffic tubes which give us a sense of how many vehicles are coming by, what percentage are trucks, how fast are they moving. Um, and so we're really proud of that data record that we're all building together so we can manage things effectively. And finally, the MBTA bus operations have kind of joined the party. They now have point of boarding uh, data for their, uh, for, their, for their Charlie card users. So we can actually add these things up and say on a given afternoon, Prospect Street, we hear it all the time. Prospect Street is really, really challenging these days. And it's no wonder something like 80 or 90% of the human beings moving through Prospect Street are doing, through, doing so in a 20 foot uh, you know, steel box, a two ton steel box, an automobile, generally one person. Look, everybody has their own mobility needs uh, and opportunities, and some folks don't have the luxury of living close to where their jobs or their services or their schools are. We get that. But I think our society has kind of denied people the choice to get around by bus, by walking, and by bicycle for far too long. Prospect Street is one example. But look at its twin. Look at Webster Ave. So you see a much more balanced uh, pie chart here for Webster Ave in this particular data analysis, where more like 50% of the humans move in are, are, are by car. Webster Ave is a massively important corridor for bicycle riding, which Mike uh, will talk about in, in a moment. Um, and then you get a sense of, hey, here's Somerville Ave, here's Washington Street. There was a question earlier about McGrath Highway. So this is just illustrative and evocative of the way that we use mobility data to then kind of customize not only how we get through construction cycles, but how we build a carbon neutral city, how we build a socially equitable city. The average Somerville household spends like ten or $11,000 per year to maintain a motor vehicle. 
If you have the choice to go from a two-car household to a one-car household, for example, not ten or eleven thousand dollars off of your annual household budget. That translates to three or four hundred dollars a month in your rent or your uh, mortgage payments. Transportation is part of an affordable housing strategy. Transportation is part of a social equity strategy. So, um, Green Line. This is uh, you know obviously you know, the biggest ticket item. This is the transformative moment here that gives our residents a more genuine opportunity to lower their carbon footprint, get to know their neighbors rather than being behind the windshield where you're shaking your fist at everybody else. We're all so rude behind the wheel, uh, and then when we actually speak with one another, I think we behave completely differently, right? Um, we have been trying to get our residents ready for, as the mayor says, kind of the other side of that coin. We've been working for 40 years to bring the Green Line here. And again, folks who have been to Resistat know that they were serious about canceling it. It sounds absurd to say they were truly going to cancel this project if our mayor, our board of aldermen, our state delegation, our, our federal delegation didn't step up to the plate. And we as taxpayers had to write that check. As Rich said, thank goodness we figured out how to get something more than the transit that we deserve. We got that stormwater uh, arrangement. But one of the other consequences of saving the green line, because it was so far over budget, was giving the MBTA's contractors some flexibility in the way that they could define their construction methods. And they talked about how they can gain a lot of savings, improve safety and predictability of the construction cycle, by doing pretty aggressive bridge closures. There are seven bridges up and down Green Line uh, corridor, including the one that's closest to home here in Ward 2, which is the Washington Street Rail Bridge over by Cataldo Ambulance, Joy Street. Um, Ball Square is the other one out in my neighborhood, and we've been doing a ton of outreach on the west side because the contractor has said that in January, right after the holidays, they're going to close that Ball Square Bridge. So like we were talking about with Dane Street, we want to use every mechanism possible to get our residents, our social networks, aware of the fact uh, that a really important, regionally significant bridge is going to be closed. Bus riders will be displaced. Business owners will hurt. And we have a series of strategies that we're trying to deploy to make sure that we're minimizing the pain. So all summer, we've actually been doing more than just our traditional night meetings, asking folks to come out to a cafeteria to sit in inflexible and uncomfortable sixth grader seats. Uh, we've actually been bringing the message to the people tabling at Artbeat, tabling at summer streets, uh, having dedicated meetings in the neighborhoods, at community churches and elementary schools uh, in, in the neighborhoods. We've done about two dozen of them, and we've touched more than 2,200 of our stakeholders. We've actually counted the number of conversations that we've had. Erica Mace is our fantastic construction communications officer is here. And, uh, this has been her labor and her kind of brainchild. It's very helpful for us to know. And, and yes, 2,200 is not a lot in a city of 80,000, but it's cool that we're able to track this stuff and then think about who we're not touching. Think about who is, you know, may not be in this room tonight and may not be at those tabling events, who may not be on the mailing list. How can we get the word out in ways that are meaningful and respectful to everybody? So here's the Ball Square Bridge. We won't spend a lot of time on this, but again, dialysis clinic, um, uh, Kelly's Diner, uh, Sound Bites, and the other brunch joints are, are up here by Powderhouse Rotary. You're not going to be able to go west to east out on the west side near Ball Square for the better part of calendar 2019. It stinks. As the mayor said, it would be disingenuous and disrespectful of us to say this is going to be easy. So we've been working through a series of processes, including with the city of Bedford, because actually the municipal boundary is like right at the back of the sidewalk here. I think the front door of the dialysis clinic is in uh, Somerville, but the rest of the building is in Medford. So I'm going to breeze through the detour slides here and actually emphasize the stuff that's closer to home. Again, Ball Square matters to you all, but not as much, I think, as Washington Street. And please understand that, that you know we're taking Washington Street very, very seriously. Chief Breen and Deputy Chief Major are here uh, representing the Somerville Fire Department. They've been working hand in glove with our team, with the MBTA and their contractors, to try to evaluate response times. And, and Charlie Breen, our great chief, can uh, talk a little bit more about that. So come springtime. This bridge is going to close for most of the construction season. It's going to be about a six-month closure. Uh, we've been working again to try to make sure that as much pedestrian access, bus access, bicycle access can be uh, managed and mitigated during that time. They'll actually open it up again over the winter time, uh, and then the following spring they'll come in for another four or five month chunk of work. And it's totally crazy, right? Uh, anybody who lives here in the neighborhood knows that this is actually not one bridge, but two bridges. And it carries not only the commuter rail line up to Lowell, but it carries a nightly freight train. Uh, as folks in the Brick Bottom and the side of the Union Square will know, uh, that feeds the sand and gravel pits uh, underneath the, the Route 1 ramps down by the Museum of Science. 
Um, so all of that stuff has to be rebuilt. Again, on the good news front, folks in the neighborhood know that this is a low-lying area that's flood prone. The MBTA will be installing a great deal of drainage infrastructure underneath this low point uh, and cleaning up some of the old pollution uh, from the old dry cleaners that's just upstream of it. So it's worth the struggle. Um, we can talk in much more detail. Uh, we'll be doing community meetings all winter to help get ready uh, the same way that we've been doing over in Ball Square for the last couple of months. But just again, want to take this opportunity, this captive audience to help everybody kind of collectively wrap their mind around things. On the bright side, Union Square or the East Somerville Station is going to be the platform is going to be up here at track level. You're going to access it from an access ramp right by the bridge and the sidewalk today. The community path is being extended, and again, folks are going to get tired of hearing me say it, but it was not a foregone conclusion that we were going to save the community path. They wanted to cut it. They thought they could save 20 million bucks by not delivering the community path, which is fundamentally important to our residents as well as the entire region. So the good news is for anybody who's on this side of Prospect Hill, Union Square, Brick Bottom, and East Somerville, you're going to be able to hop onto the community path, whether you're a dog walker, whether you're a you know, person of all ages or all abilities riding a bicycle, and you're going to be able to get out to the Minuteman in one direction without getting on streets again, and you're going to be able to get to the Charles River Path Network in the other direction without getting on streets. It's really remarkable, and that will all be delivered in that same time frame of mid-2021. So let's keep our eyes on the prize. Uh, we are all ears. Use 311. There's a construction at email that, that Rich was describing, um, and we actually have an integrated hotline with the Green Line Extension people. They come to our offices every week. We are constantly badgering them about things like rodents and noise and vibration and detour issues. Uh, we want to be your ally and intermediary. So uh, let me move on very, very quickly. Uh, and maybe it's a good time to pause and take a couple of questions, in fact. Please. How do you count people on bikes? How do you count people on Question was, how do you count people on bikes? I've been talking a lot. Mike, you want to talk about how, uh, this program that you're in part responsible for? <coughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so, so um, I'm going to be speaking in like three minutes about some other stuff, but I'm Mike Tremblay, Senior Transportation Planner with uh, OSP City, City Hall. Um, so we actually have a, a fantastic group of volunteers that we reach out to once a year every fall to count something like 39 intersections citywide. We, we're adding to that list year to year, uh, but obviously the, the goal is to count the same locations in the same way every year so you can track how things change over time. So what we do is we count, uh, so if you take a typical four-way intersection, we'll, we'll imagine an imaginary line crossing two of those legs and basically count any pedestrian or bicyclist or jogger or person walking their dog or walking uh, or with their kid uh, as, a, as a person uh, walking or a person biking. And we even count the kid in the stroller as one of the pedestrians too, right? So over time we can, t we can tell how much more comfortable people feel or how many more people in this neighborhood feel comfortable walking through the neighborhood. And what we started doing last year is counting age and gender uh, at certain locations as well. So um, one thing that we've, we've uh, determined through national research is that um, women and uh, younger people and older people feel much more comfortable on, on much more uh, low stress streets than uh, you know, a typical bike lane uh, that you might see uh, on, on, uh, on Somerville Ave, for example. Uh, so we really wanted to strive to improve um, bike facilities as well as pedestrian c conditions uh, so that everybody feels comfortable walking and biking through the city. So that's sort of why, we, why we're, we're uh, counting and, uh, and, and the goal for, for counting. So. Thanks, Mike. Hopefully that answers the question. If you're interested in getting involved in this kind of volunteership, transportation at SomervilleMA.gov is a catch-all email list, kind of like the construction at SomervilleMA.gov uh, email distribution list. And we do this stuff every fall. It's a wonderful, wonderful community building uh, process. and actually saves the city taxpayer resources. Pretty cool. Um, I'd also be remiss at this moment to not talk about some other volunteering opportunities. Um, as we pivot to kind of the next part of our uh, portfolio here, our team is also responsible for parks planning. It's really fun. It's kind of a mishmash of issues to do transportation and parks and urban forestry issues, but we take a great deal of pride in it because at the end of the day, transportation is a means to an end, right? We want transportation systems that get us to useful places, whether it's the grocery store, whether it's a great neighborhood park, an elementary school, healthcare, education. Um, so here's Lincoln Park. Hey, we've made it. Thank you for your patience. No, seriously, this is $9 million of investment. This is by far the most ambitious, the most ambitious public space project this city has ever undertaken. Um, and we should be proud of it. 
it's still a construction site. There are still fences up. There are still some kind of punch list items that the contractor is responsible for. And we know that there's kind of a learning process. We've heard from neighbors that some of these new use patterns, things like skateboard noise, uh, are something that we want to work through. Confession, I'm a lifelong skateboarder. I'm teaching my three-year-old, and I've been out here a bunch. But I get it. If you live out back on Lincoln Parkway, uh, Marion Street, Adrian Street, et cetera, um, having those early starts of, of kids uh, or older folks who arrive and make a little bit of noise um, can be grating. So we're looking at those solutions. We're trying to be respectful and be good neighbors as we all learn together. So the public space side of our portfolio has a cool couple of opportunities for volunteering. Has anybody ever volunteered on our bulb blitz planting uh, annual uh, flower bulbs in squares and public spaces. We call it the Bulb Blitz. You can e email uh, the city, get on 311. And on Wednesday the 7th, 3.30 p.m., South Street Farm, down in the Boynton Yards District. Uh, that's a city-owned asset with a temporary uh, tactical urban garden, urban farm, that our great youth employment partner, Groundwork Somerville, runs on behalf of the city. And so just show up. You can work with our landscape architects, the staff who sit with me and Mike in the office uh, and plant flowers and green up the neighborhood. Uh, another one is planting trees, actually. We have a great nonprofit partnership with the Mystic River Watershed Association, the city's uh, official arborist. Dr. Vanessa Bukili manages a partnership by the, uh, which we will be planting like 50 trees over the next couple of weeks, Wednesday, November 14th. Thursday, November 15th, uh, kind of the heart of the afternoon. If your schedules allow and you want to get plugged in, um, you can email trees at somervillema.gov. Okay, thanks for bearing with me on the uh, PSAs. So let me actually truly hand it off to Mike uh, this time. Thanks for bearing with me. Folks, thanks for coming out. Resistat is a very special tradition. Most communities don't have what we have. You go to Cambridge, they don't have this. You go to Seattle, San Francisco, other progressive communities, they don't have this access twice a year. So thanks for bearing with us. We know there's a million things going on. Thank you, Brad. Um, so uh, we've talked a lot about newer projects today, and I wanted to let you guys know that we haven't forgot about some of the uh, old favorites over the years in, uh, on, on Beacon Street uh, and then on Webster Ave as well. So um, Beacon Street, knock on wood, we look. We have a we have a pretty solid end date of, of uh, late spring next year, early summer next year in 2019. So um, very relieved to be able to say that uh, we have done all the almost all or all of the overhead utility work is has been completed by Eversource and in, in the in the uh, cable companies there. Um, we uh, we hope to be fixing up that that rocky section of of, of Beacon Street north between uh, Park Street and Oxford uh, Street next week, uh, so that would be uh, doing a, a mill and overlay of all those, those patch locations to make sure that's all smoothed out before the road is paved next year. Um, we hope to be installing the, the new signals at Washington Street, at, at, Park, at Park Street, as well as the new pedestrian beacons at Buckingham Street and Sacramento Street this winter. So those will be operational uh, over the course of the winter. The construction season doesn't really affect those as much. Uh, we're waiting on the, the delivery from the manufacturer, so that's, that's the critical path at this point. Um, and then, like I said, we have some final steps in the spring. Um, uh, all the sidewalks that haven't been built yet, um, the, the raised crossings at the cycle track, the cycle track going northbound into, uh, into Somerville Ave, um, pavement marking signage, all those final punchless items will be done next year. But the, the, good, the best news here is that um, you know, the, the utility companies seem to be you know, done with their work, which is, was sort of the, uh, the hold up this, this year. Uh, I wanted to talk a bit about the pedestrian beacons. Uh, we have a few of these uh, pedestrian hybrid beacons or hawk signals uh, over in the McGrath Highway, uh, sorry, the, uh, the Kensington Underpass area in uh, East Somerville, but we don't really have these uh, in Somerville yet. The, um, they're a little bit different than a traditional traffic signal and I wanted to go uh, through here, uh, through, the, uh, through them with you here so that you're not shocked when these become eliminated in the next couple weeks. Um, so unlike a, uh, a traditional traffic signal, these are um, truly just a pedestrian signal. Um, as you can see, they're completely blank to drivers and, until the button is pressed. And I have a little animation here that I hope works, um, but <laughs> it might not. Um, but uh, in general, the, when the pedestrian pushes the button, the yellow light will start flashing, then it will turn yellow, solid yellow like a traditional tra uh, traffic light, and then red with two lights like a traditional traffic light pedestrians will start crossing, and then during that phase where it's counting down, the, uh, the, the pedestrian, the, the, the hybrid signal will start flashing as well. And the true diff difference here is that drivers can go once the, the crosswalk's clear. So that means that these signals allow pedestrians to cross safely, 
but it also doesn't hold up drivers for the 30 seconds you sometimes see at a traditional pedestrian signal. And then it goes blank again until pressed. Um, these have shown uh, through federal studies to reduce uh, total crashes by about 30 percent and uh, reduce pedestrian crashes by almost 70 percent compared to an unsignalized location. So we'll be trying these out in Somerville. Um, you know, Beacon Street will be a little bit of a test case, but if we like them there and the city gets you, and you guys get used to them there, we can apply them elsewhere. I'm going to see if this works. It might not. Oh, here we go. So it's, flat. so it's flashing here, turn solid yellow, then red, pedestrian signal. This will be longer in real life. <laughs> It'll flash for the time it needs to flash. Uh, and then um, during this time, vehicles can actually go through if the crosswalk's clear, and then it will you know, go blank again. So, we're going to have to get the, you know, the word out a little bit more. Um, these are foreign to a lot of people. There are some in Boston, some in Cambridge, but um, you know, we're, it, it's a new best practice that we're trying out on uh, Beacon Street. Really hope that you guys uh, take a liking to them. Um, any questions on Beacon Street? Yeah. Yes, they're here. Um, I live on Beacon Street, and uh, a couple of years, about a year and a half ago or so, at one of, I've talked to you, Brad. Hi. Um, I asked. Uh, with widening the sidewalks, putting in the bike lanes, uh, would that impede an ambulance or a fire truck getting through? I was assured, no, it wouldn't. Well, yes, it does. Because two weeks ago, I was sitting on Beacon Street coming home from work between Park Street and Washington Street. And it was rush hour. Uh, both lanes had traffic and an ambulance could not get through. Absolutely could not get through. People wanted to pull up on the, on the curb, but the curb's too high. So traffic just sat there. Now, I'm very concerned about that. I lived through a situation uh, with my mother. Uh, she's long dead, but 20 years ago, uh, when my mother was brought to Mount Auburn, the doctor said two more minutes and she wouldn't have made it. So whenever I sit there and an ambulance cannot get through, that's what I think of. So now that the street's narrowed and ambulances can't get through, fire trucks can't get through. I, I'm very disappointed because I was assured that would not happen, and it has. So, sorry. Chief Fallon and Chief Breen might talk about that a little bit more later, but one thing that I'm not sure is uh, included in the current signal, again, that the new signals have not been installed yet, but um, the new signals will, I, I, I'm 90%, 99% sure of this, will have uh, the Opticom system that basically, if, if, a, if an ambulance is approaching a signal, it sends a signal to the, si sorry, I'm using the same word a lot, it sends a, a message to the signal saying, hey, I'm an ambulance, I'm a fire truck, I need to get through, and it holds that light green for that direction. Um, so that should help. I don't. So I'm, then the cars can keep moving. Yeah, it, essentially, if, if there's an ambulance on Beacon Street, the light on Beacon Street will stay green until the fire truck gets through or the ambulance gets through. So basically, what you're saying is, though, because the streets are narrowed, the ambulance or the fire truck can only go as fast as the cars ahead of it can move. I mean, is, is that the situation? Yeah, the, 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 again, you know, sympathies um, for your family's loss. Um, Public safety access is fundamental to any design process, and our first responders work on those issues. The section between Park and Washington, uh, I'd be curious to actually go out there with our first responders and kind of eyeball it. And again, when Cataldo inevitably goes through there, um, I know that our first responders actually do test runs of apparatus in all types of conditions, right, Chief? Um, rush hour as well as kind of weekend or, or evening stuff to test response times. And Cataldo, of course, you know, works with them in that regard as well. One of the design decisions about that particular section between Washington uh, and Park, if I remember correctly, is a 45 degree mountable curb, right, Mike? That hasn't been installed yet. And that was specifically created for that northbound bicycle facility separating bicycle riders and giving them safety, which is obviously, you know, kind of that same public safety imperative, but making sure you've got kind of a 45 degree mountable curb so that the big trucks and the ambulances can again do that bypass. The parking was eliminated on that side and it's not coming back. So you still have one travel lane for motor vehicles in each direction. You're going to have a dedicated bike facility going northbound there. I think, and again, we, should, we will, I'm not trying to make light of this by any, by any means, um, we'll go out there uh, with another audit 
double check everything to make sure that vehicles can get around, can mount those curbs as intended in the design. Uh, and then actually, you know, as we get closer to completion of that construction project, um, that we're actually doing those test drives. You know, Dan was talking about the Dane Street bus detours. The MBTA does test drives of their buses. And, and again, it's incumbent on us to make sure that our first responders have access to, to, to all the plans and can work with us and identify issues before the final completion and before the city accepts that state job's uh, completed roadways. So uh, please don't view that as a you know circumlocution or a punt. We'll take that seriously. Do you have a follow-up on it? Thank you, Brian. One more in Beacon. Yes. So if I understand correctly, Beacon University, which was the paving university you had for Beacon Street, is all closed now, right? It's not going to be paved again? Beacon University? I'm not sure if I'm familiar with that. It's a joke. Oh. <laughs> we're just, we're <laughs> linking the tips. Are you going to rip it up and pave it again? Um, so, so good, good question. The question is whether we're going to be ripping up and paving the street again. Um, the, the section between Park and uh, Oxford Street had a lot of unforeseen gas leaks this year, which was extremely frustrating for the city. And so those patches, you know, it takes time to settle. Those will be repaired uh, in the next week or so. Um, after that, we're at a condition right now where the road is an inch or two lower than it, the final condition will be. So you see, you see a lot of temporary driveways going down into the into the road. There'll be one more run of paving, final paving on that. Um, so there shouldn't be the grind, the, the level of grinding that you were seeing this year. But there'll be one more final, you know, smooth pavement condition. Two weeks later, pavement markings will go down, um, signs will go up, things like that, and the project should start to look finished. There'll probably be lingering things here or there after that happens that need to be completed, but. One more paving run, knock on wood. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, uh, I'm going to move on to Webster. Uh, I have, I, again, I'll be here if you have more questions on Beacon. Uh, again, transportation at snarbrelly.gov if you have any questions about Beacon Street or anything else, if you, if you have any, uh, any curiosity. So um, one thing I want to highlight here is uh, the Webster Ave. This, we're talking about the Webster Avenue uh, section south of Prospect. Um, Last year, we, uh, with the neighborhood support, with the mayor's support, the Port of Albany support, uh, removed all the parking on the street between Webster, on Webster Ave, between Prospect Street and the city border uh, at Cambridge. And um, the goal was to put in uh, separated cycle tracks, which, uh, for your, uh, for your uh, background information, Webster Ave is the second uh, busiest bicycle corridor in the city uh, behind Beacon Street, which is the number one, which carries about 500 bicycles a day, a day uh, during the peak periods. Prospect Street, something like, what, 250, Ken? Something like that. Uh, so, uh, and that's with the, the current conditions on Webster Ave right now, which is, is essentially uh, mimics the, the surface of the moon. Um, so one thing we want to do here is, over the next week, in the same kind of mobilization as that Beacon Street paving, um, smooth out the section of, the, of where the bike lane would be if it wasn't so rocky. Um, and, and, and put a nice smooth pavement there and uh, really formalize that, that separated bike lane that we strove to put out last year. Um, we would also follow up with, uh, with flexible delineators there as well to really separate that, those, those hundreds of bicyclists uh, per hour going into Cambridge and, and coming home at night. Um, so that's something that we're really looking forward to doing uh, before the end of this construction year. And then uh, we likely won't be able to paint this year uh, because the temperatures are cold, but we'll, we'll come back in the spring and paint some lines as well. So hopefully you guys will see that in the next couple weeks. I wanted to go over some of, this, um, some of the data we had um, that might help out your, your uh, understanding of why this is a benefit for not only bicyclists, but for pedestrians and for motors as well. So as most of you know, um, one of the primary factors for a serious crash versus a, a fender bender or a property damage only crash is speed. So, and, and as a lot of you have told us, um, you're, you know, speeding through your neighborhood is, is something you want to curtail, right? So um, we're looking at ways to do that uh, and also solve some other issues as well. So we did a couple of experiments where we put down uh, tra traffic counting tubes, which also happened to collect speed uh, at various places throughout the city and, and did a before and after experiment. So on, on Mount Vernon Street, in East Somerville, between uh, you know, Pearl Street and uh, Broadway, we put down a, a buffered bike lane, which is a, a bike lane that has a couple extra feet between the uh, bicyclists and the cars to, give, uh, to provide a, a little extra comfort. And we found that speeds went down a mile an hour on average, um, which again, may or may not be uh, statistically significant. But we also saw that the number of vehicles speeding went down 17.5%. Um, so uh, that's encouraging. We want to we want to repeat that 
um, you know, with other experiments. We also want to try out that again. Uh, we, we envision, again, flexible delineators along that stretch, or even planters to, to beautify that stretch. Uh, if we do that, we repeat the experiment because that vertical barrier might slow uh, cars down even more and, and add some more protection. Um, similarly, you may have noticed on Webster Ave last year when we painted it, um, high visible crosswalk, which we, we, we use with paint to mimic a brick, a brick back crosswalk and tan bump outs. Um, we, we applied that at, on uh, Webster Ave last year. We plan on reapplying that this year or, or this year or next year. Uh, but we also applied it on Broadway and uh, Winter Hill. And we found that th these really helped to slow cars down on this particular application. We found that uh, speeds went down about seven miles an hour on average, uh, and the number of people speeding went down by half. Um, so again, Broadway is a bit different example than most streets that we would apply this kind of thing to, but um, if it is making a difference, even a mile or two an hour uh, on, on a Webster Ave or a Prospect Street, it's really something we want to consider. And then this is sort of a precursor. If the neighborhood likes this and thinks it's a good idea, we could potentially think about a, a larger project that would actually install those bump outs, install a race crosswalk, um, you know, other traffic calming measures like that. We wanted to, to, to point out that even the interim stuff that we're doing around the city seems to be making a little bit of a difference. I think that's the end of my presentation. Anything on Webster Ave or anything, uh, or these experiments that we talked about? Yes, sir. Webster, I know you guys have all kinds of stats and stuff like that, but the eye test for it coming from Cambridge, trying to get onto Webster Ave, as opposed to going straight onto Prospect with that light there, I mean, it's, it's really dangerous, number one. And number two, at the bottom of Webster, last year I was here, and I think I spoke to you, about the traffic signal, and you said it was going to be last this spring that we were going to have a dedicated green arrow to make from Somerville Ave onto Webster Ave because that is really dangerous. And it's been a year and I haven't seen it. Um, I'm just curious what the update on that is. No, it's a good point. Thanks. And, and you know, sometimes in our quest to be responsive and again honor where we're here and we, we say yeah gosh you know here we are it's November uh, we're going to get a contractor back out in the spring and they're going to do that uh, we've had a variety of financial and technical challenges that have prevented us from getting the crews up in the cherry picker trucks replacing that equipment that should have been spec'd differently five years ago when the original design work was happening so we haven't given up the ghost or given up hope uh, that we're going to actually replace that and provide for some of those dedicated left phases um, but we're clearly you know just like Webster Avenue with the paving we're behind the schedule that we all led you to believe last year, and that keeps me up at night and makes me feel badly. Um, I would, however, say that the two-way traffic pattern change on Webster and Prospect was always referred to as the early action project. It was intended to be a relatively lightweight, quick deployment mechanism to generate some flexibility with the traffic patterns, in part for the $60 million sewer separation job that Dan and Rich were describing earlier. We never represented that that investment that we made uh, was the Union Square of the future or was the Prospect Webster of the future. Frankly, I would love to blow up that intersection. The geometry is so awful um, that I think, uh, you know, the, the tactical uh, destruction of it and creation of something more urban, more geometrically responsible with shorter crosswalks, with cleaner, uh, you know, uh, traffic signalization would be warranted. If that's a New England style rotary, you know, those are things that we explored in our neighborhood planning process for Union Square. So we will be back as part of those conversations about the future of Bow Street. Anybody who participated in those neighborhood planning processes several years ago know that our vision for Bow Street is actually a pedestrian priority street where the car is truly the guest and not able to exceed like 10 miles per hour. Um, Somerville Avenue between Bow and Bow, as we call it, uh, was, two -way street, was a two-way street long ago, and it ought to be returned to its two-way functionality. That would start to take pressure off some of those neighborhood cut-through uh, streets as well. So we're not done working on a community process about envisioning those intersections, uh, those, those scary and challenging pieces of signalization, crosswalk deficiencies. We just got a report from a near miss at the corner of Webster and Newton from a bicycle rider. More and more of them are using GoPro cameras to actually videotape. And Ken, uh, 
Ward II resident, our fantastic bike committee chair, passed along this constituent complaint and this, this near miss observation. Um, please understand this stuff keeps us up at night and, and we cannot deliver projects as quickly as we want to, and as quickly as you deserve, um, but it doesn't mean that we're not trying and looking under the couch cushions for funding, uh, thinking about ways to co-locate our work with private utilities or private development interests to actually address some of these legacy issues. So uh, bear with us and we will uh, rectify and clean up the intersection of Prospect, Webster, and Concord. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everybody. Um, so next up, as, as several of the speakers have alluded to and had some questions to, um, we're going to hear from uh, both the fire and police department, because um, it's not just the engineers and planners who are looking at this stuff. Um, Chief Breen is going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the fire department's considerations and then turn it over to Chief Fallon to talk about uh, some public safety things going on in the neighborhood. Good evening, Charlie Breen. I'm the fire chief. Here with me is Chris Bajic, he's my Chief of Operations. Uh, just here to quick uh, talk briefly about the fire department and our role. Uh, I live up, up, up in West Somerville on what's going to be the wrong side of the Ball Square Bridge. Um, I love my job, but I don't love it to the point where I, I get up at 6.30 every morning to get to work because I know if I wait till quarter of seven, I'm going to be sitting in traffic. So I get up at 6.30 to head to work. I also have to deal with my wife who drives my daughter to Somerville High School every morning and calls me up, not too happy with me, and says, can't you do anything about this? And I'm like, I'm just the fire chief. <laughs> she, she texted me the, the mad face emoji the other day as she was sitting on Highland Avenue with my daughter. So, uh, but I'm looking forward to having a Green Line station, two Green Line stations within walking distance of my house. So, I, I mean, we're all gonna have to suffer through it, but it, it'll be worth it in the end. Uh, I'm, I've been on the job for 33 years. In the 33 years we've had, I've, I've uh, been working, We've, I've probably had nearly a dozen bridges closed in the city, and the fire department has dealt with it. That's by modifying responses, changing response patterns. Um, the city has five fire stations. Uh, the two that are con concentrated for this area are Union Square and then some of Alab and Lowell Street. We also have Engine 7 up on Highland Ave, Engine 6 and Ladder 3 up in Teal Square and five fire headquarters, Broadway by McGrath Highway. We also have probably one of the best mutual aid systems in the country in Massachusetts, and uh, Somerville has a great automatic aid system with Cambridge. Cambridge has three fire houses that are just over the line. It's Cambridge uh, Street down by Leachmere, Inman Square, and then Mass Avenue by Porter Square. We have an excellent relationship. Uh, we have such a system that um, we don't even have to call them if there's any calls on the Somerville Cambridge line uh, through, a, through a telegraph system, I would call it. Uh, they automatically have apparatus started if the calls are on the Somerville Cambridge line. The fire department uh, is meeting constantly with, with Rich, with, with Dan. Dan's become my best friend in the last couple of weeks over this Union Square situation. Um, Brad's got me on speed dial. Um, it, it, the mayor is very concerned about response times, um, and the fire department is as well. A as you can see, um, in the past year, response times, even with everything going on, the response times have gone down. Uh, since I became chief, we've modified some responses. Uh, one of the first things I did was I get a weekly report of uh, excessive response times. So we're always monitoring the responses, and if we have to make a change, we'll make a change. If it requires, if we find out that there's construction going on, and Rich does a great job every week. He notifies us about all the projects going on. If I see an excessive response time, and we'll analyze it, and if we can send another truck from a different direction, that's what we do. Um, the first thing I'm gonna do tomorrow is I'll be checking out Beacon Street uh, in, in that area. I have a feeling that there could be, we have a great system of uh, traffic preemption devices. All the fire apparatus has a uh, flashing strobe light that, that trips the that trips the traffic light. I have a feeling that maybe there could be an issue with one of the Opticons down there, so I, I will check that out tomorrow. But uh, the fire department is involved in, in all the planning, and uh, we're a partner at the table on all this. But as you can see, uh, response times are, are well, well below average. Uh, five, five minutes is what an NFPA says they want us to get in there, no, no, no later than five minutes. As you can see, we're well below, well, well below the curve. It's constantly being monitored, 
And uh, as soon as these bridges close, believe me, I'll be out there, Chris will be out there, we'll be, we'll be watching the data and we'll make changes as necessary. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you very much. So uh, it's a pleasure to be there tonight. Uh, Chief David Fallon from the police department. And um, just to speak about the, the, the construction of the city too, is we have a di different deployment system than the fire department. We don't deploy from fixed locations. We actually do our changeover at the schools in the city. So the construction is really not gonna affect the police uh, radio dispatched cars uh, to an extent that would impact public safety. In public safety, some really some amazing crime numbers in the city of Somerville. Absolutely amazing. When you look at index crime, is down 2% over the last two years, and violent crime is down 18% those two years. But really the bigger number is 2018 is projected to be a 32-year low, citywide low in crime. That's a 69% decrease in crime. Absolutely amazing numbers. You know, as police chief, you, you know, you sit with your command staff, you think, you know, how, you know, how is this coming about? It's really civic engagement. It's people coming to these meetings. It's every summer street event. It's block parties. It's just people involved in taking ownership of the community. And as a chief, you're just proud to see it, and you really love to see it. A typo on the slide, I apologize, says Ward 5, should say Ward 2. We haven't seen the same increase this year in index crime in Ward 2 as we have in the um, rest of the city. When we looked at that data, the reason for that is we had a, a, a spike in house breaks in the winter of 2017 in Ward 2. When we looked closer at that, we saw that 57% of those cases, either the front door or a door in the house was left open or a window was open. And that was the means of entry. So we really employ you. We mapped them out here to take a look. We made an arrest. In the, 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 the spike, we don't see the spike at this time, but we do employ you to lock your doors and lock your windows when you're not at home. Big, the good news for Wood 2 that over the time period, violent crime has decreased 28%. So it's very great to see. What we're looking when I became chief in 2014, it was about the same time that President Obama came out with a 21st century task force on, on policing. And at Sambo Police, we've really used it as a guiding light on the type of policing that we want to render to the residents of Somerville. So oh, I outlined real quickly right here, building trust, the six pillars that we follow within the Somerville Police Department. Number one, building trust and legit legitimacy. It's the first one, it's probably the most important. It really focuses on procedural justice as a philosophy in the police department. Because we think that philosophy in the police department can lead to institutional cultural change. And we're really seeing that take hold within the Sample Police Department. Policy and oversight, all our policies are online. You can go online and look at every one of the policies of the Sample Police Department. And the reason we put them online is because we want your feedback. We want you to, to help us deliver the type of policing that the city deserves and the city wants. That's how the police are going to be su successful, is when we police in, in conjunction in, 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 in lockstep with the community. So all our policies and procedures are online. I employ you to take a look at them. Um, we're a certified police department. Uh, it's the first time in the history of the summer police department. Within the next six months, we'll be an accredited police department. And what that says is that our policies meet the gold standard in policing. So our policies have all been rewritten, they've been put online, and they've been vetted through um, groups like PERF, the police, police Executive Research Forum, who looks at all those policies. Technology and media, we, 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 we've increased our, our social media platform, and now we redesigned our new web page as well. Uh, the, the last three pillars of 21st century policing, community policing and crime reduction, Sample Police was awarded the 2018 Community Policing Award um, in the category of over, population over 50,000 from the New England Chiefs of Police. We were very honored to get that. A partnership with Teen Empowerment, a, a group in the city that works with at-risk youth and addresses issues within the community, was recognized um, by the National Law Enforcement Museum it's an inaugural temporary <coughs> exhibition in Washington, D.C. So I, I think we're getting recognition for the type of policing we're providing. Training and education. All our officers have received training on impartial police, impartial policing, uh, procedural justice, and, legit and legitimacy training. 
uh, our core office uh, is our, our, it's community outreach, help and recovery. Uh, it's amazing what it's doing. Um, our grant funding is up close to $400,000 for that program. Uh, now Sumble Police in the lobby of the police department has a licensed clinical social worker who follows up on all our mental health calls. We have a drug and addiction specialist at the police department who's working full time, who follows up on all, on all those calls. We're, teach, we're teaching through that program 26 area police departments on, on, on how to respond to people that are in the throes of, of mental health crisis or drug addiction. And really teaching officers that when you go to such a call, your first instinct and the best tool that you have to deal with that is de-escalation, to de-escalate that call. Maybe the last two you have is arrest. Really connecting that person to social services within the community is how to best resolve that call. So I give a lot of credit to some of the police officers who are really buying into that program. And as I stated, we are currently teaching 26 police departments. And we're the only core office that part of that training has implicit bias training. So we're talking to officers to realize that everybody comes to, into the world of whatever position profession you have with some implicit bias, but <coughs> recognize it. Recognize it, accept it, you know, and, 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 you, and, and think it through on each call. So really exciting what they're doing. We're doing advanced training through that office, um, motivational interviewing, uh, communication with parents, tactical verbal skills, and risk assessment when officers go to the call. Call office is training the community. We have Recovery Coach Academy, Mental Health First Aid, uh, med, uh, youth mental health first aid as well. So we're recognizing, you know, the mental health aspect and the element of, of police calls. And we're focusing on the last bill too, as well as officer wellness and safety, because we believe that an officer has to, you know, has to be sound and has to be present when they're at a call. So we're teaching officers, you know, take care of yourself physically. Never forget why you got into policing, to be the guardian of the community. And that's your role in the community to be the guardian. So what we're really looking at is incorporating these six pillars in the police department, but then rewarding officers who take on this philosophy of policing and help promote them into the specialty jobs within the community. So I think we're having great success. There's always room for improvement. And, um, you know, it's really, but it is an honor to serve the city of Selma as your police chief. So I can take a couple of questions as well. And I do have some, actually some statistics on, on the park and the opening of the park. We are working with, with the city, we are working with residents, there has been an uptick in group calls, we're well aware of that, but again, we want to address that issue in conjunction with the community and how the community wants to enforce those rules with the park so everybody feels safe visiting the park and enjoying the park. So I think when you have an over-utilization issue, it's not necessarily the worst thing to have, but we know it does disrupt some people's lives. I can take a few questions or a question if anybody has a question for me. All right, that's great. Thank you very much. All right, I know that was a lot of information we tried to jam into a relatively short period of time. Um, and believe it or not, in every ward of the city this fall, we have a similarly packed agenda. There is so much going on. Um, so thank you so much for uh, sticking with us, getting through it all. Um, hopefully this will be helpful um, for you to know what's coming up, that you plan your, your lives and commutes a little better. Um, as we leave, I, I wanted to ask you all for two favors. One is if you have friends, neighbors, family members um, who aren't tuned into what's going on, uh, point them to the city website. Let them know that they can sign up for uh, the city's email newsletter, the construction uh, email newsletter, city alert, uh, calls, texts, and or emails, um, as well as find links uh, to all of our social media channels. Um, especially in the next, uh, next couple of years with so many projects going on. There are gonna be street closures, there are gonna be detours, um, and it's always better if you know about that stuff ahead of time, and those are some of the channels you can find out uh, about those things ahead of time and be prepared. Um, the second favor is please stop by the pizza and snack table on your way out. I'm not sure what all is left over there, but I want to carry as little of it home as possible. So please enjoy and thank you. It, it, 
one question or? Uh, Conway Park? Yeah, I don't know if, if folks want to stick around for that. If not, Brad will be here. Uh, Ian, we're in the process of updating the city's website on Conway. Uh, so we just got some stuff from the city's licensed site professional that's been transmitted to the Board of Aldermen. It'll be on the city's website tomorrow.